شكرا ربنا يخليك يا حبيبي ربنا يخليك So uh, uh, let's start our meeting today. Uh, 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 hi everyone who may be watching us uh, from everywhere. Um, it's uh, Cairo time, 6, 6 p.m. Cairo time and 6 p.m. Spain time and 5 p.m. Algeria time. Today we have a very uh, uh, interesting uh, uh, meeting. This is the fourth international uh, uh, webinar of the Memorial Institute Kids Eye uh, uh, Center. Uh, today, today we have a very interesting uh, topic for today meeting. This is the challenging uh, cornea uh, cases and uh, live discussion. We have uh, uh, many uh, international speakers, respectable and respectable national speakers, uh, and also our uh, cornea, uh, uh, my cornea uh, consultants, me and my doctor and my colleague Dr. Emil Gonimi, as uh, uh, usual. Uh, so you can watch this video through the. Uh, Zoom platform or even through the Facebook uh, li uh, uh, page live uh, stream. But we encourage all of you to watch us and follow us uh, uh, through the Zoom uh, platform so you can engage with us uh, with your questions and with your uh, comments. And we have special requests from all of you just to leave your questions in the Q&A box and not in the chat box. So for all the panelists and speakers, for all our panelists and speakers uh, to be more easier to answer you live or even uh, by uh, texting. Uh, uh, and I'd like to uh, thank uh, uh, Novart's company for sponsoring this meeting. And I'd like to thank uh, RM organizing company uh, for uh, uh, sponsoring uh, uh, this uh, uh, very, uh, and, uh, to be very uh, interesting and nice uh, gathering and meeting today. Uh, and now we have a very uh, small introduction uh, about uh, our previous meetings and our today meeting by my colleague, uh, uh, Dr. Emil Wani. Uh, welcome everyone. Thank you, Dr. Heba. Well, uh, we had we had very interesting international webinars uh, for our uh, mic. Uh, we had one in the strabismus. We had one uh, very interesting uh, international webinar about glaucoma and a third one about pediatric cataract with a special hot topic, ectopia lentis, with a special outstanding guest speakers. And to, to the, tonight we, we are very honored and glad to have our fourth international webinar about a uh, very hot topic uh, of the pediatric uh, cornea uh, problems. Um, we, are very, we are very glad to have Dr. Jose Gual, Dr. Siham uh, Lazarg, and uh, for international guest speakers, Dr. Mohammed Sada and Dr. Uh, Mahmoud Ismail. Uh, also, of course, we have our expert, uh, the Mike uh, consultant, mm -hmm. the consultant, Dr. Uh, Mohammed Salah, and uh, Dr. Uh, Rasha Musa. So we are very glad to have you all, and uh, we are very interested that we will have experience from three countries, from Spain, Algeria, and Egypt. So we are very glad to have this experience uh, for tonight. Uh, just a small view about the, the Memorial Institute is something uh, really with, since 1913, and uh, so it, uh, it's a long history. But recently we had our Memorial Institute Kids Eye Center which is an outstanding uh, center specialized only in pediatric eye um, examination and pediatric eye uh, management with special in, uh, 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 clinics and also the specialty pediatric uh, eye uh, subspecialties. They are uh, very nice, child-friendly inpatient and, uh, and outstanding OR rooms. Uh, let me first uh, present Dr. Mohammed uh, Salah. Dr. Mohammed Salah is the main founder, actually, of this uh, of the Memorial Institute Kids Eye Center. He was the founder of this center. He was first the dean of the Memorial Institute since 2014 to 2018, and then the, the president of General Organization of Teaching Hospital. And during this phase position, he had a great vision to have a particular aim of excellent pediatric eye services in the mayor, a dedicated, highly specialized, fully equipped center for children's uh, children's eye. Uh, for tonight, uh, tonight's meeting, we have two parts. The first part will be talks from Professor Dr. Mahmoud Ismail, Professor uh, Siham Lazarg, and uh, uh, Dr. Rasha Musa. And the second part will be the panel discussion. At that uh, time, we will be joined by Dr. Gual and Dr. Mohammed uh, Hamad uh, El Sada, and of course, Dr. Mohammed Salah is with, with us. Um, so, uh, uh, please, Dr. Emma, let me introduce uh, uh, my friend, uh, Dr. Rasha Musa. 
uh, from the efforts of uh, Professor Dr. Muhammad Salah to improve the uh, um, to share in the improvements of the pediatric ophthalmology uh, practice in Egypt to the efforts of uh, Dr. Rasha Musa uh, to uh, um, to uh, provide the cornea department in our institute with all the uh, surgeries that she can do. She give uh, her uh, all out effort to uh, uh, teach the young generation and she is a very talented cornea uh, consultant and also a pioneer uh, uh, in all the cornea uh, and refractive uh, surgeries and uh, to help all the kids in the institute in even the challenging and difficult uh, cases. Uh, uh, Dr. Rashla is now a cornea and refractive consultant in our institute and a head of uh, a department in the institute. Uh, 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 welcome to the meeting, Dr. Rashla, and please start uh, presenting our uh, international guest and national and respectable national guest speakers. Thank you, Dr. Heba, uh, for these nice uh, uh, words. Uh, I'm, going to, I'm glad to uh, introduce uh, Dr. Sihan Lazur. Uh, she, uh, she's one of the uh, pioneers uh, in uh, our uh, community and uh, in all Africa. She obtained her medical degree and completed her residency at uh, and fellowship at uh, Paris Detroit uh, University in France. Uh, she worked as an associated professor in University of Mustafa Basha in Algeria for Algiers uh, till uh, 2008. Uh, and now she owns and manages a private practice focused on treating ocular surface diseases in adults and children in Algeria. Uh, specialized in uh, pediatric ophthalmology and ocular surface diseases. She's a, she's a leader of ocular surface in North Africa, uh, scientific coordinator in Algeria ophthalmic societies, a member of uh, the ambassador of TAFOS DIOS II, and she's a member of a board of uh, French Society of Ophthalmology and a very dear professor to all of us. And we love her so much. Uh, uh, I am glad, I'm very glad to introduce Dr. Mahmoud Smail. Uh, he's a head uh, professor uh, of uh, Azhar University, uh, his master degree from the University of Al Azhar, and he completed his PhD in ophthalmology from University of Alicante in, uh, Fran uh, in Spain uh, during 1996. Uh, he's a professor of ophthalmology and head of the ophthalmology department in University of Al Azhar in Egypt, is aw he's awarded by with many prizes uh, during his uh, academic life and published many papers and participating in various national and international conferences and one of the pioneers of reflective surgery and from the uh, very early uh, ophthalmology doctors who is uh, specified in uh, refractive surgery in Egypt and uh, uh, of course in the Maghrabi Eye Hospital also. Uh, our, uh, of course, I'm going to introduce uh, uh, also our MIC uh, board members, uh, Dr. Ahiba Mitwalli and Dr. Ayman Gonini. Uh, okay, we start the talks now. Yes. So, uh, the first section, uh, uh, let's start the first uh, section uh, of the, our uh, meeting today. Uh, it will be about the uh, uh, very interesting talks uh, on topics in the pediatric cornea. Uh, and we start by uh, 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 presenting uh, the first talk by our professor, Dr. Uh, Mahmoud Ismail. He will talk to us about the uh, challenges in the pediatric PKP. Dr. Mahmoud, the platform is yours. Thank you, uh, Dr. Ahiba. Dr. Arasha, Dr. Ayman, and of course, my dear, my dear, my dear colleague and uh, one of the pioneers in cornea and refractive surgery, Dr. Muhammad Salah. Thank you, Memorial Institute, to join all these faculty and among, and we have to welcome Dr. Asihan to our webinars. Actually, it's a challenge to go in for pediatric keratoplasty. To know how it's difficult, keratoplasty started in the early 19th century. But for pediatric section, it only 1968 started the pediatric population. The American Academy of Ophthalmology had a very nice review about the strategies to optimize outcomes. And we had the pleasure to join with it. And these are the conclusions and recommendations that we will start speaking with it 
and and they have to uh, implement our experience here in Egypt in such cases. I have to remember uh, Dr. Amona Nabi, which was a candidate for PhD, that she started with me to recount the cases in the year 2001, and to have to have the thanks to Professor Mohammed Seda, who invited me to the pediatric meeting in the year 2003 in Luxor to present the first review of cases of pediatric cases in Egypt. We have to ask ourselves several questions. What, are, what is the minimum age to coordinate transplant? Is it six months? Actually, this is completely failure. Less than two years, the recommendations of less than two years is very strict. And unfortunately, the results of success is less than 40%. From two to 12 years, the success rate improves, but we have to face a lot of challenges. What to do before the, the, year, the two years of age? Well, eye patching and training, and that's it. We don't have it. anything else to do. What is the most common pathologies to be treated for pediatric population? Unfortunately, scars and infection in ears in Egypt had a very wide scale, about 20% of cases. Penetrating wounds and dystrophies, as you know, we have, the, unfortunately, the consanguinity is the major uh, issue here in the Upper Egypt, and of course, the congenital opacities. What are the high risk cases? First of all, the uncontrolled glaucoma. Cynicia and cataract with or cases that need secondary oil are also high risk cases in pediatric population. When we treat a child, remember something that's very important. You are not treating an adult. You are treating another kind of human being. This human being will live for 70 or 80 years later. So you have to think about how to treat him. Unfortunately, in a case like this, in a case of Afekia, that was originally partial uh, aborted Peter's anomaly, and one surgeon admitted to do a cataract uh, extraction for this child and ended by this disaster. Afekia, total corneal opacity, and you have the worst thing in a case of pediatric population, the peripheral anterior cyanica. So what we do in a case like this? First of all, you have to reconstruct the anterior chamber, make a clear media, Preserve the eye as much as you can, guard the canis secondary glaucoma, and then leave the case for secondary implantation in a year, two years child. And this is the post operative of the case, how it looks. Another issue that we have faced the rupture globes and the penetrating wounds that this, in a case like this, the, pre, the surgeon who did the repair, he was very, uh, very meticulous that he left for me a remnant of a posterior capsule that you can implant secondary oil during keratoplast. In a case like this, with more or less clear media, you are planning a, a sec a, a, a in situ secondary oil. And this one type that we have a patent with it, this is a loop loop IOL. That it's a, the, the IOL it has a, a whole loop attached to the, uh, the optic part. And this fixates very well in, in the sulcus for a pediatric population. In a case like this, if you can repair the iris, well and good, because you need a scotopic pupil not more than six and a half or seven millimeter of diameter. Otherwise, the higher order aberration and the low quality of vision will lead to a, definitely to ambiguity. Iris clove and scleral fixations are, op are options, but I don't, I really can encourage all the surgeons to try to match with sulcus implantation, which is the most safe in the cases of pediatric population. This is how it looks in the post operative, the pre operative, and this is the post operative case after a few months, is the same day of removal of sutures. When you treat the case of penetrating keratoplasty, and unfortunately the majority of pediatric population 
for the cornea transplant are penetrating keratoplasty. When you treat them with a successful IL, like in a case, a successful graft, like in a case, uh, like aniridia syndrome, this have not finished yet because there is a deep amblyopia management that you have treated to the patient. Besides how to, to examine the child. Some cases that unfortunately are due to negligence are due to unawareness, like cases of blood stained cornea. And this is one of the very worst cases that I have met that the cornea still has stained, sidrotic, and new vascularized with peripheral anterior cyanic. Also, cataract is present. So you have the whole menu of difficulty in this case. You are aware that this might lead to bleeding, so be careful. And blunt dissection comes first, then sharp dissection. Then you open the capsule by cautery. This is a very uh, old trick that I have learned from general surgeons. You have retracted and solid capsular axis by cautery. You use the cautery of, and then you have the pleasure to put the IOL in the bag, not in the side, because you have a stretched cauterized anterior capsule that can withstand the pressure of implanting in a, a six millimeter intraocular lens in the bed. The anterior part, uh, posterior part of the cornea with the, with the capsule. So peripheral anterior cyanicia is, is a, a, a handicap in such cases. This is the post-operative, and I would like to remind you again, you have to take a glance of the patient in one second because the child is not fixed uh, on the state lamp as an adult patient. When you are treating a, a, a child, remember when pre-operative, he might be very nice, but in the post-operative, he changes to a monster because he is not... He knows that you have done him a harm. For him, this is a harm, making a surgery for him. Also, in cases that this is a peculiar case of dermoid, limbal dermoid, and a previous surgeon have done for him a cataract surgery. I don't know why he did him cataract surgery. You have to go for tectonic graft. The, the, the child doesn't want to go to school because he looks very ugly. And the, of course, the eye is not functioning. When you try to dissect a case like this, use the cautery for this section. Plant, plant the section with cautery because you might face a lot of cases of heavy bleeding. This is the removal of the lesion, partially in the limbus, partially in the sclera, and you put the uh, you are treating this patient as, a as if it's a tectonic graft. But actually, you have to give each patient your best. You might, be a, you might face a surprise, a nice surprise at the end that we will see it now in the end of the, the video. Sutures in, in pediatric population, I really recommend interrupted sutures. But if the child is 10, 12 years old, you might look for regularity because you would like to have regular cornea. So you might have a combined continuous and interrupted. This is the post-operative. And then after uh, six months, you discover that the, the tectonic graft is getting clear and the only opacity is in the sclera. So you don't have to go for, uh, for, uh, uh, for another graft, just implant secondary. Oil. Cases of anterior, deep anterior lamellar using the big air bubble technique and stromal hydration in some cases are not very frequent. It's only in keratoconus or superficial opacity. And this will leave us to the second pathology. Is DMEC suitable for cases of pediatric population? Theoretically, yes. But unfortunately, I never did a DMEC in a child till now. Because there are always a surprise. In cases of CHET, congenital hereditary inferior dystrophy, it's, it's a very shallow anterior chamber. And I never uh, accomplished. Suture technique, as I told you before, I really, in cases pediatric preparation, uh, population, I 
prefer interrupted sutures. We come to the last hard two questions. The immunosuppressive drugs can be used, well, unfortunately, never before eight years of age, only in selective high-risk cases with a small dose of 20, 25 milligrams per day. However, in cases of routine, you have uh, steroids, you have to give them routinely with a long duration, tapered very longly, and as usual, the dose that we all know. One nightmare is to have associated glaucoma with PKP. Trabeculectomy usually fails, and unfortunately, you have to go for valve implantation. Cyclophotocoagulation with diode laser might solve some of the cases. In the post-operative, should we give beta blocker or dorsalamide? And I really suspect that prostamides and prostaglandin analogs can function in cases of pediatric population. Suture removal is crucial in the early, as early as part of the post operative If no vascularization appears, maximum six months, you have to remove all sutures. Sometimes after four weeks, you move all the sutures. If a tiny vascularization appears, you have to remove all sutures, even if it's very early. Lastly, and last, not lastly, think in the old days, how did they treat pathologists? Pediatric population start started keratoplasty as much as they can. This is very wise to choose. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Dr. Mahmoud, for, for this very nice uh, um, and interesting and many challenging cases for uh, uh, pediatric uh, PQP. Uh, of course, uh, um, uh, yeah, we need a comment from uh, uh, Dr. Mohamed Salah. Dr. Mohamed Salah, do you have any comments about the uh, uh, all the valuable data Dr. Uh, Mahmoud Ismail just said? Please unmute, your, unmute yourself, Dr. Mohamed. Uh, please unmute yourself, Dr. Mohammed. Is it okay now? Yes. Yes. Hear you. Okay. Uh, one question for time being. Uh, do you think this surgery valid for one eye or not? Uh, if the other eye is completely normal and this eye will be amblyopic uh, after? Uh, do you have any idea about how to treat this resultant amblyopia in this eye? Yes, this is a very crucial question, Dr. Salah. As I told you in the last uh, uh, slide, in the old days, take the wisdom from them. They re refrained from doing keratoplasty uh, in children because of the results, the deep amblyopia. So, how can we manage this? Especially if the one eye is very sound, if the, the, uh, if he, the, the child has a sound eye with very good vision, the other eye will go and belong very easy. Eye yes. patching from the first day. Eye patching from the first day. This is the only solution. And yes. the, problem, the problem in the, uh, the post-keratoplasty, it's a long post-operative. The child is very, uh, very uh, annoyed very aggressive with you. He, he is not easy to examine. Usually take him for general anesthesia, examination and general anesthesia, because you want to, to, to deal with the pressure. The intraocular pressure is one of the great enemies of uh, penetrating keratoplasty pediatric population. And actually, if we I find a good colleague like Dr. Ayman Gonemi, I will slide the case for him to treat the amblyopia and I will, I will sleep very cool. <laughs> This is a okay. good idea. I'd be happy to Very proceed. good idea. <laughs> and I, I would like to, to, to add something to, to Mahmoud. Actually, the, the, the refraction is, 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 is usually an, a crucial point in the treating of amblyopia. The refraction is, is commonly, of course, as you, of course you know, uh, co commonly changing, but we, we keep changing glasses because sometimes we have a very high cylinder, which is by itself is highly amblyopic. So, in a, uh, yes, as, as the old, I remember the old days with Dr. Mahmoud in, uh, in, Mar in Marabi work together. Uh, sometimes we can go for the examination under anesthesia, cornea consultant together with the pediatric ophthalmology consultant, do the examination, do the refraction, 
and change frequently. I always consult the, the, the parents that they, the glasses power will change frequently, sometimes every month or every two months. But as, as you, you, you both said, it's very important in um, hitting the amblyopia hardly in such patients. So Mahmoud, I have a question. Please. Uh, 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 what, you, what did you do in the cases of uh, presence of glaucoma or instance of glaucoma in uh, pediatrics? Uh, usually we have a problem even before the surgery in these complicated cases with the presence of glaucoma already or peripheral anterior synechia and then with the steroid responders uh, after that. Uh, would, you, would it be wise to deal with it with the, in, uh, in a teamwork with the glaucoma surgeons to uh, put uh, valves or whatever? Uh, do you think this could be wise? First of all, thank you, Dr. Arasha, for this very nice and, uh, question. Actually, don't enter the surgery room to perform penetrating keratoplasty in a child with controlled intraocular pressure on medication. No, this is not a controlled case. The mm -hmm. child has to enter to the surgery or to recruit the patient for surgery with self-limited Intra, normal intraocular pressure. You cannot go for surgery for keratoplasty for a child on medical treatment because definitely in the post-operative, you will have a very high pressure because of the reasons that you have just said. With this. So it's a, it's a an a closed box, you will open and you will find something inside. Usually, I deal with the, the, the glaucoma case as a glaucoma case has to be controlled thoroughly without medication. The problem is, even if so, you will find yourself confronted with a case of glaucoma after the surgery in the post-op. Trabeculectomy in children with keratoplasty, seldomly uh, success, with a very, very few success rate. Unfortunately, at the end of the day, you have to perform a valve. And if you go to the literature, quite a lot of cases of pediatric valves are for post-PQP cases. Yes. Unfortunately. Uh, it's uh, it's a very common complication with pediatric PQP. Yes, Either it's from very the common. condition, it's very common. Uh, would you prefer to do it, uh, Ahmad valve, regular Ahmad valve, or there is a special Ahmad valve for for uh, children. children, and I don't do it myself. I refer it to some for of our surgeon. colleagues that they are very uh, common with it. Uh, would you find it, uh, Doctor Mahmoud? Is it wise to uh, to assess the effect of the opacity on the uh, real effect of the opacity? Sometimes we see a very uh, deep opacity in, in children and it's not affecting the vision. So it's not like others. Uh, sometimes yes. uh, it's uh, it's not wise to do PKP for a child with the, all the complications, except if it is uh, affecting the vision, severely affecting the vision. Yes. If the patient is uh, more than 6'6", six, six, I wouldn't do anything for him. Totally agree with you, Dr. Arasha. Dilatation, eye drops, patching, and that's it. Wait and wait and wait. Success rate, the whole success rate of pediatric population published by us, in, and, and it's the same recommendation. And uh, we have the, the pleasure that um, the American Academy referenced me and Dr. Mona Nabi, the thesis of Mona Nabi in, in the year 2003. The, recommenda the, the outcomes are the success rate of the whole pediatric population is not more than 40%, unfortunately. So you are entering in the surgery and ten of, in, in, in six of 10 of the patients are, re are rejected or they have a big problem or they might have a bigger problem even than rather than the preoperative uh, problem that they have. Dr. Sihan, you have any uh, uh, question or uh, any uh, comment? Uh, please unmute yourself, Dr. Siham. I'm sorry, I didn't get this. Yeah. Can you? Can, I'm asking can Dr. Siham. 
بس يعني آه. شي هذا آه. كمنت اه دكتور سيام Can wait, can wait, maybe for scar or uh, after herpes keratitis. If you can wait for uh, for KKP, what is the best time to do it with the best age? Yes, timing Uh, uh, the, 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 the opacity is confined, is circumscribed, there is no reaction, there is no any kind of uh, latent uh, even inflammation. And I never before six months, never. Because in pediatric population, Dr. Asiham, you are very cautious, you are short-handed, and you are you know very well that you are entering in a war. It's not a, a normal surgery, and you have all the antidotes against you, the the family, the the the, the your guilt, sense of guilt if this, something goes wrong to the child. Uh, I remember very well uh, a case of uh, uh, Bufthalmos. We had a repeated uh, glaucoma surgery, and at the end, they did him a, 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 a valve. The patient had navigational vision of somehow the, the child had a navigational vision. He this was his single eye, and I refrained to do him a keratoplasty because I. He can grab the, the dish and eat alone. So I refrained to do him keratoplasty for about two years. And after two years, I found the family coming to me that they have operated the child abroad outside Egypt. And now he is no PL with uncontrolled intraocular pressure. So what to do with a case like this? So I thank God that I have refrained the, the doing a keratoplasty for such a child. Thank you, Dr. Mahmoud. We have to shift Dr. Siham. Uh, please, uh, please share your screen. She will give us some something more beautiful than this. <laughs> oh, <laughs> I don't think so. We will see. <laughs> the, uh, first of all, I would like to thank uh, the Memorial Institute and uh, especially Dr. Arasha for the invitation and for the, the kind uh, introduction. And, and I would like to talk about the corneal involvement in uh, uh, allergy in, uh, in uh, allergy in pediatric population. And I will focus my talk about vernal keratoconopathy, which is the most uh, severe and the most common uh, allergy in, uh, in children. Uh, this is a severe form of ocular allergy that can cause severe visual complication, and you will see what. And it's more frequent in the Mediterranean area. In Algeria, uh, Morocco, Egypt, and Tunisia, we, we, we see a lot of, and many, many of them, many, many severe cases. In Central Africa, which is in North Africa, but the cases are different. It's not the same case that we see in Japan, India, and Australia. That it's very frequent uh, under warm climate. Uh, just one word about uh, pathophysiology. This is the last, the latest uh, classification uh, in uh, 2012 by Andrea Leonardi from Italy. Uh, he uh, classified the ocular surface hypersensitivity reaction on ocular allergy. Uh, and the ocular allergy, in the ocular allergy, we have two kinds of allergy. We have the IgE mild mediated uh, allergy with annual and seasonal allergy, allergy conjunctivitis. BKC and uh, AKC, which is the atopic keratoconjunctivitis. This is for the adult uh, person. We have also uh, pediatric cases. And then the non IgE mediated uh, with the BKC, AKC, and the, uh, all the contact blepharoconjunctivitis. And in the older hand, we have the non specific hypersensitivity with the giant papillary conjunctivitis, which was classified before as an allergy and, not, and now it's not an allergy at all, it's only a non-specific hypersensitivity and uh, irritative uh, conjunctivitis and also the uh, irritative blepharoconjunctivitis. 
Uh, then uh, BKC is an IgE and TMC mediated uh, disease, that this is uh, a mixed uh, allergy, leading to a chronic inflammation in which eosinophil, and you will see why I'm, uh, this is very important, lymphocyte and structural cell activated are involved. It occurs mainly in children and improves at the age of the puberty in main cases, but we have, we have also uh, other cases in the real life, unfortunately. It's rarely seen before three, uh, uh, three uh, years uh, and, uh, or after 30 years of age. After, uh, in the adult age, we see uh, almost uh, IKC and after three years, it's not very common. And the incidence is higher in males than females by the ratio of three to one. But in the real life and in North Africa, we see the, the, the sex ratio is not uh, as, uh, as marked as in Europe. And this is used, uh, BKC usually appears seasonally from early spring till autumn. This is the literature, but in our countries, the, the summer is long and we have 300 days of, uh, of sun, then we have uh, the perennial uh, BKC. What are the ocular symptoms? They are very, very intense. We have foreign body sensation, tearing, severe photophobia, and we have very, very disabling itch, uh, itching and the mucus secretion that you see in these pictures. Uh, we have a secretion like a white of the egg and the bilateral damage often asymmetric. So this is always bilateral. If you have a an, uh, an unilateral allergy, it's not an allergy and it's not an uh, BKC. Search for another etiology. It's not an allergy at all. And the corneal involvement are very, very common. This is why we call it a keratoconjunctivitis and not a typical allergic conjunctivitis. And we, uh, it, uh, this uh, involvement can compromise the visual function and visual uh, uh, future of the child. We have three types of BKC, the tarsal form with the only involvement of the tarsal conjunctiva, the limbal form with involvement of the lamb, the lambris, and the mixed with the form of the, uh, the, uh, the involvement. The tarsal BKC is characterized by, by a cobblestone light papillae, which are very uh, big, uh, more than one millimeter of uh, on the upper side of the conjunctiva. But I will show you. Um, uh, we have uh, non-common cases with uh, an, uh, 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 papillae in the uh, lower uh, side of the conjunctiva. Like you see here, the, the cobblestone stone are very big and they are inflammatory. What are the corneal involvement in this disease? As you see, uh, this is the panorama of all corneal involvements. Uh, and I will uh, talk uh, of them one by one. Then we have pseudogen toxin, we have bilimbal infiltrates, superficial content, keratitis, ulcers, neovascularization, and you see more. Then the limbal infiltrates are two forms. We have the, uh, the, the trontat nodes, the classical ones, with a nodes like this, and these nodes are full of eosinophils. The eosinophil uh, is playing a, a major role in the pathophysiology of this disease. And we have the eudematous uh, uh, form. This is the, the granular, granular or nodular form with the trontal nodes. Then the deep trontal nodes are, can be very small uh, like this, you see here. And they, they, they may be very, very uh, important like this. And you see here in this form, you have an upper uh, cobblestone in the upper side of the conjunctiva. And we can have the gelatinous form this is a lambus edema of the lambus, and this is an, 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 uh, an lambus. The pseudogenal toxin is a degenerative lesion in the parpibular cornea resembling uh, uh, resembling uh, cornea arcus like this. Dr. Siham, Dr. Siham, yes. Could you wait for yes. a second? There is a background noise. Yeah, uh, it's not in, uh, in my. Uh, Okay, it's not from you, but uh, they cannot hear, so we have to... Um, would you please, uh, uh, Karine, would you please mute all and uh, mute all the... Oh, this is better now. Now, I'm still hearing it. Uh, RM, I think, with problem. And uh, Dr. Ian, please try me to start 
Yes. So. Wait. So it's your mic, Dr. Sihan. So, Dr. Sihan, just uh, now unmute yourself now, Dr. Sihan. Yes. Um, unmute yourself, Dr. Sihan, please. Oh. Uh, there might be a problem in the mic, in your mic. Uh, maybe, uh, is it better like this? I can use, I can use the, the other mic if you want. Maybe it would be better. Right. I can use it. Try, try another one. Is it better like this? Um, here, this no, the, this noise is not for me. I don't have any noise. The background is not. Uh, this is more and It's not uh, here. I'm not. Yeah. Now it's better. I'm not. I'm not hearing the the back voice. بس احنا احنا سامعينها لسه يا دكتور اه هي ال ال انا سامعه اذان بس الاذان مش عندي انا ما عنديش اذان دلوقتي لا هو انا كده انا كده عامل ميوت للروم كلها اه الصوت برضو لسه انا سامعه أوه. هو واضح ان هو من عند حضرتك الاوضه لوحدي ما عنديش صوت خالص في مروحه شغاله او تكييف او اي اي جهاز سحب حاجه من الكهرباء أنا بأوضة لوحدي وما ما عنديش مقفلة عليا الباب. أيوه أعتقد لو حضرتك نقرب المايك و لو معايا الأستاذين دكتور سامي لو نعلي صوتنا شوية ممكن ده يغطي على أي باك جراوند نويز موجودة ممكن يعني. عشان نك... حاجة قرابي كده يا دكتور سامي. Is it better? Yes. Is it better? I'm using the mic, the another mic. Is it better? Dr. Asihan, could you put it uh, uh, a little bit far from you and try? Like this? Okay, yeah, we have to continue. <laughs> Sorry. I don't know what to do, uh, but it may be from the mic itself. I think it Maybe. I'm not hearing you. I'm not hearing you. I can raise your, your voice a bit. Like this, this can let us uh, recognize the, uh, the, the, the words in like that. You can start proceeding with it. Okay, you can you can continue, Doctor Sihan. And I was talking about the pseudo gel toxin, which is not. Uh, this is a signature of an old uh, VKC. It's not uh, an active one. This is a waxing and welling grade white lipid deposit in the parpebral superficial stroma, like you see in this picture. I don't have. I can. And then we have also the punctate keratitis, which is the most frequent corneal involvement, uh, often diffuse, not like, not like um, for example, in dry eye when the, the punctate are in the lower part of the cornea. With the, this is a cellular disaggregation, epithelial disformation toxicity caused by the cytotoxic protein. The corneal ulcers uh, are often uh, unilateral. Uh, it are uh, in the most of time a uh, superior part in the superior part of cornea and we have three stages of genesis the grade one is a shield ulcer with a, a, a clear base like you see in these all these pictures and the grade two is the, uh, the ulcer is the same but with a visible inflammatory debris at the base uh, and with the delivery uh, and fertilization and the grade three we اسف على المقاطعه ممكن نجرب نشيل الشاحن بتاع اللابتوب اوكي كده ممكن ده لا هو لسه مفيش فرق لا كده طيب ممكن نقرب المايك بتاع السماعه من بقى حضرتك اوكي كمان 
هو 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 ال ال هو للاسف المايك ده كده مش شغال يعتبر اوكي اي ممكن ممكن بس نجرب نعمل حاجه في السيتنج بتاعت المايك في الارو اللي جنب علامه المايك اللي باصص لفوق كده هندوس عليه وهنختار سيلكت ا مايكروفون في سهم تحت على الشمال جنب كلمه جنب علامه المايك الصوت واضح يا كريم ممكن كونتينيو Uh, I think we can proceed, uh, Muhab. Uh, we still hear uh, Dr. Uh, Siham voice. Yes, yes so we can hear your voice, Dr. Siham. We can continue. I can continue? Okay. Yes. We can continue. That the grade three is uh, the famous vernal plague that's uh, giving the name uh, to, the, to the, the disease. That these are the three uh, stages of the genesis of the vernal plague or the corneal plague. This is the Cameron classification. This is the stage one, the stage two, and the stage three in the same patient. And after surgical treatment, we have, this is before, this is immediately after surgery and two months later, and you see, and then we can uh, have a good results if we, we proceed immediately, if you proceed to surgery immediately. This what we need to see, to know, is that uh, these vernal uh, ulcers are not uh, mechanical. And many, many of us uh, are thinking that they are due to the, to the uh, cobblestones. No, it's not uh, at all mechanical. They are chemical and they are uh, due, uh, this, this is uh, to, to the, like you see here, to the eosinophils. I told you about, it, about eosinophils. These eosinophils are releasing a cytotoxic protein like MBP and ECP and these uh, cytotoxic proteins are involving and they are uh, uh, giving to uh, like, like, like burning the cornea and giving us all this pancreatic keratitis uh, and this uh, corneal ulcers and corneal plague. Then it's not uh, a uh, mechanical ulcer, this is a chemical ulcer. This is why in this ulcer the treatment will be uh, uh, high doses of uh, steroids. And we have also infection uh, complications like uh, secondary to the disease or to the treatment, maybe a primary or secondary herpes infection, which is very, uh, we have a very, uh, uh, most of my patients have this uh, complica corneal complication. We have herpes uh, on VKC patients. We have also staphylococcus infection in anterior or uh, posterior peripheral arthritis with all the complications. And also we can have, unfortunately, in our uh, uh, vernal children, vision loss, uh, secondary to stem cell deficiency. As you see in this, uh, for seven years old girl, in spite of all treatments, I really, I, uh, uh, expected for hell, I experienced for her all my all the treatment cyclosporin, dexamethasone, all, and she and you see between the day zero and after two years she was totally blind and unfortunately it was bilateral. Then this seven years old was totally blind after after two years of evolution of the disease. This is another uh, twelve years old girl. You see the stem cell deficiency and this uh, old man, uh, the twenty. Uh, five years old man, as you see, he's uh, uh, totally blind in his, uh, his left eye. This also, this uh, young girl, and you see then that uh, VKC can be a uh, uh, cause of blindness in uh, children. Then we have also another complication, corneal involvement. This is neovascularization and corneal scar. As you see in this picture, the corneal scars, when we remove the corneal plague too late, and when we treat too late, we can have scars, and these scars are uh, giving us uh, amblyopia and uh, visual problems in the uh, in the children. We have also uh, about keratoconus. This is, uh, in my opinion, one of the most important uh, complications that we don't see because when you have a scar, when we have an ulcer, we are treating, but we are not aware about the corneal biomechanics of these children. 
if, if, if you have to, if I have to give you only one message after this topic, just please do uh, topography in your, all your BKC because I have a huge number of uh, uh, problems, biomechanics problems, keratoconus in my Bernard children, and I have a study on the, of uh, on the, uh, uh, 800 uh, patients, more than 800 patients, and we have 22, uh, 21 percent of keratoconus in my skin. This is uh, uh, this is really uh, scary because we have, if we don't uh, uh, see. The refraction and the topography of this season, the, the, the evolution is very, very fast, and they, and they, you find them in stage guide uh, four of uh, uh, of keratoconus very quickly in uh, less than two two years, and uh, the aerobic may causes these changes in the corneal curvature, and we have now many many publication uh, understanding the pathogenesis of uh, pathogenesis of keratoconus, but not only the aerobic. The aerobic is only one. Uh, theory and only one mechanism. We have also the inflammatory, uh, the, the inflammation in this uh, in, in this disease. The inflammation may change the the biomechanic of the cornea, and uh, and this is proved in many uh, studies when they found it in keratoconus patient with the allergy, um, uh, molecule, uh, inflammatory molecules in the tears, and maybe this is the future of the pathogenesis of keratoconus. When if we can find biomarkers for these patients and to pre, pre diagnose this keratoconus and to save the visual uh, future of this child. And uh, this is these are the corneal complications. Now, what are what is the treatment? The key actions in this allergy is the eviction of the allergen when we found it because it's not very easy to find it in BKC because it's an IgE and non IgE mediated uh, allergy. Then, in 50 cases, uh, percent of cases, we can uh, do a brick test and find the allergen, and but in half of cases, we don't have any uh, any uh, allergen and any uh, etiology. We have uh, we have to learn to the parents how to do eye washing with the saline or, or only on only with with the with clear water, and the wear of sunglasses and cap is primordial. This is most more important than the treatment. The sunglasses and cap. The prevention, the protection from UV is uh, UV light is very very important. We have also the uh, anti-allergic medication, the antihistaminics with the, the levucabastine and the, the coticotifen, and the mast cell stabilizers, the chromoglycans and the n acetyl aspartic which is very effective in this disease. And the usual doses are two drops a day uh, on, with uh, for the antihistaminics and uh, three to six times a day for the mast cell stabilizers. In when we have corneal involvement, we need to do, to give an anti-inflammatory drugs uh, as a topical steroids, which is the gold standard. And we give very the, the doses are very high, six to eight, um, maybe ten times a day for one week to ten days and stop immediately. This is this is the rule in BKC. You have to give high doses in a short time and you stop immediately. In, in, in uh, the cases when we have many relapses and when we have uh, cyclosporin available, it's not the case in my country. Uh, you, you, we need to use the cyclosporin, but at 2%, the dose of two, a concentration of 2%. For example, the iCurvis or the restasis are not uh, used for the BKC. They are, this is the uh, concentration, for, concentration for dry eye. And in my uh, practice, uh, for these cases, for these severe, case, severe cases with uh, frequent relapses, I am using the intratarsal injection of trimcinolone, uh, which improves the, the signs and symptoms in 24 hours and for uh, six to eight months. And uh, we can uh, have uh, uh, a normal life for these children. They can back to school. They can play with their uh, friends uh, for for many uh, uh, many uh, for uh, one uh, big part of the of the year, and in the most severe cases we can uh, use the tacrolimus ointment because that's it, but it, uh, it's not uh, 
We don't have the authorization for that, but we use it under, uh, over uh, authorization. I am using the Pacrolimus uh, ointment, which is this dermatological form, once a day in the in the upper side of the, the eyelid. Here are my cases. Uh, you see, at day zero, you see this is a non-common form with cobblestone in the upper in the lower uh, part of the of the tarsus, and at day seven, you see shift completely the tarsus nodes with the this is uh, day seven after intratarsal injection of trimethylol. This is also another case at day zero at day seven after, after removing of the ulcer and the cleaning of the ulcer with the scrubbing. Uh, uh, surgical scrubbing and uh, the exabetazone, you see, we have a very nice result. This is not a carnal complication, but we need to to, to talk about it, all the iatrogenic complications. I have children we are, which are not so uh, bad after uh, after puberty, puberty because, because we have a complete, uh, complete uh, uh, healing of the, of, the, of the disease. But they have all the iatrogenic complications due to the steroids self-medication. I don't know if in, in Asia, but in Algeria, you can buy steroids in the pharmacy without any prescription, which is very dangerous. And uh, the people, parents are giving steroids to their uh, to their kids to go to school and to uh, and to back to normal life. But they are not aware about all the all the complications, the steroids related glaucoma, the cataract, and the cortisone dependency. And also, this is very important, the neurological disorders in these kids, with they may, uh, they have, all of them are, have academic and scholar delay, and this, uh, these severe cases need really an effective and durable solution and psychological care. In conclusion, I can just say, uh, this is severe ocular allergy, this uh, compl coronal complication may be very severe, leading to a loss of vision, and the early diagnosis and early treatment with a good prevention may improve the coronal outcomes. Thank you for your attention. I'm sorry for the, for the noise. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Sihem. Uh, um, it's really very uh, uh, nice, very valuable presentation. Uh, and reach many uh, discussion points. Uh, uh, of course, we need to know the opinion of all the panel, our panelists today, and uh, Dr. Rasha and the, everyone about this uh, case, and we need to ask you many questions. But the first case in our panel uh, discussion in the second section uh, in today meeting will be about the same case. So we will postpone these, all these questions to the first case uh, in our panel, and we will shift uh, uh, just for now to the uh, next talk, Dr. Rasha Musa. Uh, we, she will talk uh, to uh, uh, us about the uh, differences in the pediatric uh, keratoconus in management uh, diagnosis and everything. Yeah, Rahab, Dr. Muhammad Sada, welcome. Muhammad Sada had joined us. Welcome, Dr. Muhammad. Welcome, Dr. Muhammad, to the meeting. Hello, how are you, everybody? Thank you very much for the invitation. Welcome. Thank you, Dr. Muhammad. Thank you, Dr. Muhammad. Thank you, Dr. Muhammad. Thank you, Dr. Muhammad. Thank you, Dr. Thank you, Dr. Thank you, Dr. Muhammad. 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 Thank uh, uh, now we are going to talk about the pediatric keratoconus and challenges which we face in the diagnosis and management. Actually, we see uh, a lot of cases which is a little bit at a younger age now. Usually the keratoconus uh, appear at the uh, adolescence, but now you can see uh, more cases between the age of 10 and 18 years old. The youngest case described was a girl with Down syndrome at the age of four years, uh, published in uh, 2015. Uh, the uh, pediatric keratoconus have a very distinctive features compared to adult uh, regarding its clinical appearance, the uh, disease progression and treatment. Uh, these features include that it's more advanced at the time of the diagnosis, uh, frequent progression and rapid progression. Seven folds higher risk for uh, needing uh, PKP, 
usually they are eye rubbers, especially uh, children with vernal keratoconjunctivitis and a very high association. First degree relatives of keratoconus patients are at a higher risk of developing keratoconus. Uh, systemic association, uh, one of the most important systemic association is the Down syndrome, where there is a very high uh, instance of keratoconus in them. Uh, and they all, usually they appear with uh, 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 um, progressive cases and uh, usually late. Uh, atrophy and Marfan syndrome. The ocular association most important is vernal keratoconjunctivitis. As Dr. Sihan said, the percent reaches 20% of the cases with vernal keratoconjunctivitis may develop keratoconus. Uh, also with the retinitis pigmentosa, aniridia, and corneal dystrophies. The challenges uh, comes from uh, the late diagnosis, the very late diagnosis of, the, uh, of these children and the faster progression, unsuccessful uh, conservative care, control of the eye rubbing behavior in a child is a little a bit very uh, difficult. Uh, accurate tomography for children is not very uh, easy thing to do. And follow up, we need to follow the children at a, a very um, a short interval which may be not so easy. The diagnostic challenges include that there is no obvious changes at the early stages. So uh, the changes usually appear in the uh, moderate cases and severe cases. So uh, we have to screen for this uh, or search for these children. The anterior surface changes, especially with that which is associated with the vernal keratoconjunctivitis, makes the topographic diagnosis is very challenging. Sometimes we cannot diagnose whether it's anterior surface changes only or not. This is, uh, reveals the importance of tomography, which is, an, which is not dependent on the anterior surface only. It depends also on the posterior surface of the cornea, which is not affected by the, uh, the surface changes. Who are the at-risk patients uh, who needs uh, to do uh, 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 tomography for them? The high unstable astigmatism, especially if more than three diopters, is, uh, is a risk, is an at-risk patient. Unilateral myopia and astigmatism, usually myopia and astigmatism is a bilateral condition. If we see a progressive myopia in a child in one eye, especially if it is variable, and uh, or astigmatism, which is variable in one eye, it's an alarming sign. Uh, tomography is a wise thing to do. Patient with a first degree relative of with keratoconus, especially sister, uh, same siblings, sisters and brothers. We see a lot of cases by screening. Uh, presence of systemic association as uh, uh, Down syndrome is also in as a, is an alarming sign. Uh, they should be screened all of them, all of them. Eye rubbers, especially with vernal keratoconjunctivitis, also should be screened. The tomographic finding is not uh, different than that in the other criteria. Presence of one of the criteria of keratoconus, uh, which is a high K-reading, skewing, inferior steepening, uh, uh, inferior uh, uh, in decreases thickness or back elevation, means that the child is a, a keratoconus suspect or even definite. Uh, keratoconus. This is one of the cases which we discovered with uh, the screening. He's an eight years old boy for two sisters having keratoconus completely normal uh, uh, on the clinical uh, examination and having a plano uh, with minus two in this eye and six six vision. The other eye was uh, emetropic and this was his uh, topography. Uh, he is candidate uh, for uh, cross-linking also. There is risk factors for rapid progression. If we see these factors in a child, this means that he is going to have a rapid progression. Uh, the lower sinus corneal thickness, the higher average K, the increased posterior elevation, frequent eye rubbing or presence of allergic disorder, this is, uh, is, uh, is an alarming or high risk factors. These children need uh, more aggressive uh, management and uh, more uh, rapid management. The clinical appearance in pediatric keratoconus is a little bit different than that of the other, that they have a more central cone 
and less irregular astigmatism, this will explain why these children come late. They cannot uh, um, appreciate the, the changes in, the, uh, in their vision as they have a central cone. There is no distortion of the uh, pictures. They have a good binocular visual function until both eyes are affected. Uh, the clinical appearance of them, they have the same clinical uh, symptoms than the adults, but the, with more rapid progression and the patient requires surgical treatment at an earlier age. They have a high risk of acute hydrox, especially in Down syndrome. Maybe this is the first presentation of a child with Down syndrome in the acute hydrox. Actually, most of them are, uh, most of them I see will have a, a presented first presentation with acute cornea and hydrops. Uh, signs usually of severe progression. This is a child with the, uh, the, uh, Down syndrome with acute hydrops, signs of, uh, of uh, vox trier or corneal opacity. Uh, the one thing that the scissoring in the retinoscope appears very early in the diagnosis, and it could be used as a screening by the pediatric ophthalmology uh, uh, doctors. It, it would be very helpful for them. Uh, the treatment challenges uh, appears due to the rapid progression and the aggressive stages uh, and poor compliance of the patient and necessary modifications in the treatment modalities, which make the treatment very challenging for any doctor. The main objective of the treatment is halting the progression of the disease, visual loss prevention, and ultimately avoid corneal trans transplantation, as we hear from the previous lecture that Corneal trans transplantation is not a journey operation, especially in children. Uh, treatment of the associated condition, especially in vernal keratoconjunctivitis, is very crucial for these children, as this may uh, affect uh, the, their vision uh, and affect the efficiency of our treatment. The only treatment that proved to be uh, preventing the progression is the cross-linking, and the protocol uh, will depend on the severity of the case, the patient cooperation, availability, availability of riboflavine and irradiation devices to meet the individual patient needs. Uh, we face uh, a lot of challenges with the cross-linking. It's not a journey also in children, as corneal healing is not always, there is delayed epithelial healing. There is a severe post-operative pain and we have to manage it. There is endothelial cell loss in children Failure as the cross-linking is not the same efficiency as in adults. Uh, presence of complication may affect the vision severely, especially in these ch children where we may have a, a visually significant case, corneal opacities or even infection. Limbal stem cell damage is one of the cases that we should, one of the complications that we should take care of it as uh, the limbal stem cells is already compromised, especially with vernal keratoconjunctivitis. The non-surgical options, including the spectacles and contact lenses is not very easy as we see in this picture, not easy for a child and not always tolerated and often insufficient. So we are going to have more surgical option. The intracorneal rings and uh, DALC and uh, PKP, it, is our surgical option. We always we hope to find the children uh, before needing these surgical options. My take home message is that early detection and rapid management of pediatric keratoconus is crucial and vision saving. The keratoconus screening and frequent follow up is mandatory for any child at risk. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Dr. Rasha, for the nice presentation. Uh, uh, Dr. Siyan, Dr. Mahmoud, uh, Dr. Rasha, I think you have many questions in the Q&A box uh, uh, from the, uh, from the uh, uh, attendees. Uh, please try to answer these questions by texting because we, are out of we ran out of time and we cannot uh, answer those questions live. And now uh, let's shift to the second section, the panel discussion uh, about uh, many uh, pediatric cornea uh, challenging cases. Um, and that we are waiting for uh, our uh, um, international speaker, Dr. Jus Joel, to join us. Uh, and we have uh, uh, our respectable, valuable uh, national guest speaker, uh, Professor uh, Dr. Mohamed Seda. Uh, 
دكتور محمد السيدة بليز دكتور أيمن Yes, Dr. Muhammad Seda is uh, the, god, the godfather of the pediatric ophthalmology in Egypt. Uh, he is also uh, the founder and the president of the Egyptian Association of Pediatric Ophthalmology and uh, Strabismus. Uh, uh, welcome, Dr. Muhammad, uh, for the meeting. Thanks for joining us. Uh, and we are waiting for uh, Dr. Joel to join, uh, the, uh, to join us to start the uh, session. Please, Dr. Russia. And Dr. Guell is trying to connect again. Uh, he's trying to connect. Uh, Dr. Mohamed Seda is, uh, um, in, we are very delighted to have you here with us. You are the godfather of all the pediatric ophthalmology. Thank you very much. Thank you. It's an honor to be invited by the Memorial Institute, a place that I value very much and a place with great potentials in the future after establishing the pediatric uh, hospital. I really hope it will be a great addition to pediatric ophthalmology in Egypt and in the Middle East. Uh, thanks, Dr. Mohammed, for always being so supportive for the um, my project. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Mohammed. It's a real, real ad and a real honor. Uh, Dr. Rasha, I can, I, I can suggest you, yeah, you can uh, start discussion of the last presentation presentation till Dr. Gwell uh, uh, join uh, us. Uh, okay, I will uh, start. I will start sharing my screen. Dr. Gwell had a connection uh, problem and he entered. Uh, we can start the panel discussion then. Okay. okay. I'll wait for a second. <coughs> الحقيقة يعني عبال ما الدكتور رشا تحضر المحاضرة أنا بحب أعيد تاني الشكر للدكتور محمد السادة هو ما كانش يعني ما كانش استدخل ساعة لما أنا كنت بقول البرزنتيشن محمد حكي أعيد تاني هو طلب مني أن he asked me to make a talk about pediatric keratoplasty and at that time, it was very difficult because the cases was very, uh, يعني, you refrained your hand to do keratoplasty in children, but he encouraged me and um, he declared 45 minutes for me for a talk in an international meeting. It was an international meeting in Luxor. I think it was uh, year 2004, Dr. Mohammed, تقريبا, Yes, yes, 2005. 2005, yes, it was. And we collected a lot of data, Dr. Costeda, uh, uh, from this invitation because I had a candidate that I was always naming her, uh, Dr. Amuna Nabi. She's now a professor of ophthalmology. And uh, thanks to her, she collected a lot of data and encouraged by Dr. Seda, we had this uh, paper uh, published in year 2006. Thank you, Prof Dr. Rasha, please. Uh, okay, we are going to start now. Uh, Dr. Sihan is still with us? Or... Yes. Okay. Yes, I'm here. Uh, okay. Because <laughs> <laughs> uh, we, we, we are having a case which will discuss all what, we have, what you have said. Yes. Our first case will be a six, year old, a six years old child presented with right photophobia in ptosis. Actually, this was the, his uh, main complaint, the ptosis. Uh, examination revealed uh, severe papillary conjunctivitis, large corneal ulcer with positive staining and corneal opacity, wind filtrations. Uh, the right uh, uncorrected visual acuity was at that time 660. And this was his picture. You can see uh, how uh, the uh, cobalt stone uh, papillaries were very large. And this was his picture with the uh, tosis. And he's the other eye was completely uh, free, and as you can see, this uh, type is, uh, yeah, the, uh, the conjunctiva is very clear. Uh, our treatment was directed toward the cause. We did sub tertiary injection of steroid. We, we put contact lens application and uh, uh, topical moxifloxacine. We started steroid, but we wait until uh, there is epithelial healing. And we did uh, topical uh, cyclosporin 1% and tear substitute. This 
the papillary conjunctivitis improves, the corneal ulcer heal, and the residual corneal opacity remain. The mechanical ptosis improved so much, and the refraction was uh, uh, more astigmatism than the other eye, and the, uh, the visual, correct, uh, visual acuity improved to 69. We maintained the patient on cytosporin for three months. And this was his uh, picture. The ptosis improved uh, very much, and but it leaves this kind of opacity. Uh, now the uh, panel question. Uh, uh, I would like to ask Dr. Siham first, because this is your lecture. Dr. Siham? Yes, I'm here. And, uh, yes. Uh, would you think that the topical steroid alone without the top subtarsal injection would do the job for this child? Oh, yes. I, this, is, this is doing the job perfectly. But the problem this is that it will, rely, it will, have, uh, it will be uh, very nice. And after two or three weeks, you will relapse. This is why we, the separate aftersal injection is not for the healing immediately. This is for mm. not giving uh, uh, frequent uh, steroids. First, I have one or uh, remark. Don't please don't give uh, antibiotics in these cases. It's, there's no infection. Don't give antibiotics. All what you give to these patients are toxic for the ocular surface because you have preservative. You have the product that the, the moxifloxacin, the antibiotic by itself is toxic and it contains benzalkyrium uh, chloride, then don't give. Uh, this is why in Europe and even here in Nigeria, we are using steroids alone. We have dexamethasone alone without not associated to uh, antibiotic. This is not, you know, you are facing two children problem. If you give antibiotics all the time, you will have resistance after uh, for, for other diseases then just give steroids and uh, this, my protocol is to give steroids for six to ten days a strong dose with a uh, low, uh, low uh, small time and if for the first time if we have more than two uh, relapses a uh, more to, to increase of the crisis in one month I give the injection this injection is not for all the all the children and if, if the, the injection don't work, then we move to the cyclosporin. We don't give cyclosporin to all children. It's not good. This is we have also side effects. Then we, we have a protocol for each uh, child. Okay. The, steroids in presence of corneal ulcer. Uh, yes, I told you this is not a mechanical hmm. ulcer. This is a chemical ulcer, and the treatment is steroids. Don't stop steroids still healing. You will have the healing with the steroids. Uh, uh, wouldn't you put uh, contact lens to prevent this mechanical? No, 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 I don't like. You know, the contact, because it's not mechanical. And if you put contact lens, you will delay the healing because you, don't, you, you will stop the penetration of the steroid. No, no, no antibiotic, no contact lens, just steroids. If you give six drops a day, in this case, for six days, you will heal and, and you will feel very, you will feel better. Okay. Uh, immunosuppressant rule, uh, you mean cyclosporin? Uh, yes, I mean cyclosporin and tacrolimus. Yeah, uh, topical, okay, but, but not Topical, system. okay. Topical, yes, uh, but not all, in all cases. If you do the, the sopratarsal injection, it doesn't work, and he also have crisis uh, in the three months, then move yeah. the cyclosporin uh, two or three times a day for six, at least six months. Okay. Uh, would you think that systemic steroids or antihistaminic uh, have a role in these children? No. Okay. No. Uh, the antihistaminic have a role if you have a comorbidity. Uh, when we have in the case of asthma associated or uh, rhinitis associated or other uh, systemic allergic disease, if it's only ocular, it doesn't work. It's not. It's not maybe it works, but it's not very. Uh, you, all these drugs are tox toxic. We are in pediatric population. We are not in adults. Then we need to think about the future of this. Child, uh, we, and to think how to, to give 
the less toxic possible, toxic for the ocular surface and toxic for the for the body. Then no, I don't. I never. I ne you know I have maybe with the Professor Leonardi the biggest uh, series of BKC in the world. I published this uh, many years ago in Argo. Then I, I I see maybe thousands cases per year of BKC, and I never give systemic steroids. Never. But I give antihistaminic when I have systemic allergy. Uh, Dr. Rasha, uh, I think I don't know in, in Dr. Guel, uh, Dr. Uh, Guel has joined us. Yes, I I'm very sorry. I'm very sorry because I needed to change building because in, in, in my own building I had no good connection. So I'm sorry, it took a while to change from one side to the other. I, okay, I'm very sorry. We are, sorry. We, we are very happy to have you with us. I don't know. I'm very, I, I'm very happy. I'm, I'm very uh, ashamed to be late. So I'm very sorry, but I, I have needed to, to run through the village from one side to the other. So I'm very sorry. Of course, we hope to see you in Barcelona, not virtual. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Hope, hope to see you. Yeah, yeah. Hi. Hi, a pleasure Welcome. to meet you. How are you? Welcome, Dr. Joel, to our uh, meeting today and platform. Please, Dr. Rasha, stop your share and let Dr. Ayman share his screen to present Dr. Joel to the all uh, all the uh, our entity attendees today. Uh, of course, I'm I'm very uh, delighted to present uh, my dear professor, Dr. Kusei Joel. Uh, he's born in Barcelona and he has his PhD in Barcelona University. Uh, and he is the founder and uh, the head of director of the cornea and refractive surgery unit in the uh, EMO Institute in Barcelona. And he's a Mr. Professor at EMO, president of the EMO Foundation, member of Catalan Academy of uh, Medicine, and director of the uh, ESCURS. Uh, and uh, he's a post president of the uh, ESCUR and post president of the EU Cornea and founding director of the European Society of the Cornea and uh, Ocular Specia uh, Specialist. And uh, he has received many international awards and member of the uh, editor board of many uh, journals. And he's a very, very skillful surgeon uh, ever. Uh, I really enjoyed uh, being with him for uh, a while in Barcelona in, at the EMO Institute. And uh, we are very uh, delighted to have him here uh, with us in this uh, panel. Uh, thanks, thanks very much, Dr. Mosa. It, 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 is, it is my pleasure to be here and it's an honor to have been invited by, by you. And, and this, this long list basically means that I've been in, 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 in there for a, long, uh, for a long period of time, so many years, I'm getting older. And so <clears throat> that's why I have this, this CV. Thanks anyway for your invitation. And so, so again, very sorry to be late. And, uh, but if I can make a comment on your case, because I saw it in the beginning, yes. and just in, in the, I absolutely agree with uh, and Dr. Lathrec, I, excuse me, you're going to, to present another individual. Excuse me, excuse me. No, no, we are stopping the share. Can you please share the... the ah, okay. 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 Uh, okay, so so I was just going to mention that I agree with Dr. Lazek regarding the, 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 the ideas of the treatment of this, of this young kid. Uh, and but uh, from my point of view, uh, it has been quite quite useful for the chronic treatment, the use of in immunosuppressants. Uh, so, uh, so so in the in the acute phases, there is no other way than steroids, topical steroids. There is no other that works properly on for, with with the obvious risks that that we all know about them so we we need to to closely control especially pressure because the effect on the crystalline lens cannot be avoided but but as soon as we have the control or i i would say during 
we are controlling with topical steroids the case, I think that we need to, to start using topical, uh, topical immunosuppressants because you will, uh, we need to, to start when we are in high doses of steroids and then to start increasing the dose of, of, of uh, uh, immunosuppressants and start to diminishing the dose of steroids because many, many of those cases can be maintained with immunosuppressants in the long run and only use steroids from time to time. That's at least my experience. Yes, uh, Dr. there is there only one small problem. This is the availability of uh, cyprosporin in our countries. This is not available in all countries. This is why we are managing these kids. Okay. Uh, yeah. sure if you have cyclosporine, this is the best treatment ever, uh, ever, but not for three months, for six months, and even for uh, nine, uh, eight or nine months. Yeah, for, uh, for the whole, yeah. uh, uh, the whole uh, year, because in, we are in the warm countries. But Siham, Siham do, do you, yeah. you, you don't have cyclosporine? Uh, I, you, you mean you do not have a uh, commercial product or you do not have the molecule? No, you know, we, we don't have the commercial product and we don't have a center who, uh, I, in my center, I'm doing that by myself, but I don't have it in the hospital, for example, like in France, in Cannesville, or Hotel Dieu, we have we can uh, we can have the one or two percent in the hospital. Okay, the so, hospital so, so you can. Okay, you cannot prepare it. You no. cannot. Okay, and what about tacrolimus? I'm using it, but uh, off label. Okay. Not, I, I don't have the I don't have the eye drops. I'm using the ointment off label, and this is but magic. Really, this is magic. I have severe cases, and after only one one uh, week. Of treatment, they are completely clear. They, yeah. they open their eyes, and they are. But we know also that we have many side effects. We don't metrize this uh, this molecule uh, like. Yeah. Uh, like we the... we also used for many years the the ointment because uh, we were not able until I'd say six seven years ago to have it in drops. And the you ointment. Are, was, and you are doing your um, own drops. Uh, we are doing our own drops. Oh, this yeah. is perfect. Yes. This is yeah. fantastic. Also for cyclosporine, because as you know, up to 1% concentration, you can have cyclosporine in yeah. aqueous dilution. If yeah. you want to go up, then you need to, to use oil. oil. The tolerance of oil is quite lower than, than aqueous. So, yeah. so uh, we cannot prepare at the, the institute the oil concentration, but we can prepare the the, the aqueous concentration. Yeah, I, I learned that, that you know, uh, in Clermont-Ferrand in France, uh, they are preparing a two percent concentration in water, not in oil, and exactly. they use uh, and you know you know the method. I'm using this method. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Uh, okay. We can, Doctor Rasha. We can. Yes. Uh, yeah. Then um, prophylactic and the maintenance treatment. This is the yes. Uh, actually, this child comes every year with the same condition by the uh, uh, beginning summer. of uh, every summer. About every, from uh, even every, every spring. Every, every spring. spring. They, so yeah. how could we uh, give him a profil for a prophylaxis, or we start before uh, the uh, the season? This is a very nice question. You know, my how I manage my cases. I have uh, uh, thousands of them. I am. This is an, mostly a non-IgE mediated uh, allergy. Then I give mast cell stabilizers or uh, drops for all the year, from uh, the beginning of March to uh, the end of November, to cover all the warm period of the year. And I have. Uh, I stop the medication. From uh, from December to uh, last uh, last uh, February, I don't give any treatment because they are very nice. Uh, the the climate is is better, and then I I start my mast cell stabilizer before starting of the crisis. And if 
you do that every year with the wheel of the hair, with the casket, with the and the, and the sunglasses, and also all the environment. You know, you uh, the eviction of all the must the uh, mist dust and all the animals, uh, or, and you can manage this as children, but you can't manage them alone. I have an allergologist with me. You need to, to work with an allergologist because he's doing the tests. He's do, the, giving the systemic treatment. We don't have. We don't need to give the, the systemic treatment. The allergologist can manage that, and I manage them with my allergologist. I give the treatment for uh, almost the whole day, uh, year. The only must test stabilizers, preservative cream, one, and. Uh, uh, when we ha I have crisis, I give uh, steroids. And if I, I see that the crises are frequent, then I go for the supratarsal injection or for the cyclosporin. Uh, have you tried the amniotic membrane? Ha have you tried to, uh, to do amniotic membrane gra uh, uh, grafting for this uh, ulcers? What? Uh, the amniotic no, membrane graft. No, no need. are very easy to manage. You don't need. They are mm -hmm. very. If you, are, if you have an ulcer, just you scrub it at the slit lamp, yes. even if it's the child. You scrub it, you give mm. steroids, and uh, day zero, day two, the, he's, he's perfect. This uh, is uh, the I scrapping, uh, sometimes shield ulcer is covered with a uh, um, calcium, the, uh, little bit a, uh, ash, uh, a layer of a calcium plate. over a, a plate. Oh, yeah, plate. So uh, a removal of it is if very you important. You remove it with a scarificator, you know, you remove it. I have a video, but not uh, it's not uh, ready now. I have a video. We can remove it uh, in the surgery room because it's a child. And, it, uh, and if they are more than 10 years old, I can remove it at the sleep lamp, you know. This mm. is very easy. You remove it and you give steroids the first day. At day two, they are perfect. Okay. Try it and, uh, and back to me. You, <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Sehan. Uh, Dr. Mohamed Seda. Yes. Dr. Mohamed, uh, as a godfather of pediatric ophthalmology, you have seen mm. a lot of cases of the vernal keratoconjunctivitis. We have a lot of a lot of them. Uh, do you have uh, uh, what's your comments on all what we have uh, here? If you're asking about this case in particular, yes, this case is a severe form. Hmm. This patient is never going to be cured. This patient can get better, but he can never be cured until the system changes. When his age, uh, uh, he becomes a grown up and uh, he passes the phases of exacerbations of spring catar. Mm -hmm. Those cases being so severe, uh, you have to attack the condition, or at least this is what I do. I attack the situation by all possible means. Local steroids, cyclosporins, and systemic steroids. Systemic steroids play a very important role. You cannot control such a difficult condition unless you give him a systemic steroids. And systemic steroids, they don't have any complications. They have complications when you use them for a long period of time. But when you use systemic steroids in the recommended dose for a period of two weeks, three weeks, they have no side effects whatsoever. But in general, such a severe case needs to be attacked by all possible means. And those means are the local steroids. And by local steroid, I mean a good local steroid, not a combination of steroid and antibiotics a good local steroid and frequently, and the cyclosporin as well, and the systemic steroid. I believe that in a period of two weeks, they can bet, get better. Regarding the prophylaxis, the prophylaxis is by diminishing the dose of steroids and keeping him on a maintenance dose until uh, the condition generally gets better. Because those, those pediatric patients you never see them again when they are, they are grown up. Have you ever seen a boy like this boy when he is 45 years or 50 years? You never I see them. them. I saw because them. They, they, I, I see my patients. 
you know, my first patients are now 20 years old or 25, and I see them. I see them every season. We see the complications, Dr. Mohammed said. We see the lumbar stem cell problems, the uh, you, you see, you, you, pictures you, of my. You, yeah, you, you this see. case for me, excuse me, this case is not a severe case. This is a common case in North Africa. The severe cases, no, I showed, no. I'll show you what is the severe case. Just, case. just, just, just a there. second, just a second, please. You, you see, as you said, you see at least a thousand cases of spring attack. Maybe this is because you see those complications. And maybe this is why you see those cases in their 20s. I have never seen those cases beyond the 20s with the same clinical picture they present with when they are 10 or 5 years old or in the, in the first decade. Anyhow, okay. anyhow, this is the prophylaxis that I recommend is to use a minimal dose of steroids. And uh, uh, regarding the surgery of the amniotic membrane, this is a completely different uh, subject because you are talking about the management of resistant corneal ulcer. Maybe Dr. Mahmoud Ismail uh, uh, can help in this, but of course, when you manage a resistant corneal ulcer, use whatever you think uh, can be uh, of help such as the amniotic membrane. Yes, why not use the amniotic membrane? But in general, interfering with too much surgical handlings in cases of spring catar, like injections, like scrapping, like uh, uh, above tarsus injection, all this exacerbates the condition. This is not a conjunctiva that you can uh, 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 manipulate because this is a, a conjunctiva in a very bad condition. This is what I think. Thank you, Dr. Mohammed. Uh, we are going to shift to another case. Uh, we have a 40 days old child presented with unilateral discharge from the right eye, uh, photophobia and blechospasm since one week. The mother discovered that the child is, cannot open her eyes and a uh, white thing in the, in the eye. On examination, there was a large epithelial defect and positive staining. There was a dense corneal infiltration, ciliary injection, and conjunctival congestion. A case of a corneal abscess in a, in a, in a child 40 days old. Uh, we can see here that this in the epithelial defect, the infiltration takes the whole cornea. There is vascularization. We can hardly open the eye if the child is still too young. We took a uh, culture uh, and asked it for ultrasound. The ultrasound was normal. Uh, we give uh, fortified eye drops, uh, Vanco and Fortin, on our hourly interval with cycloplegic uh, for over 48 hours. After 48 hours, the culture results shows that there is a candida in the direct film and gram-positive cocci, which is sensitive to uh, vancomycin and levofloxacin. Uh, actually, we are uh, uh, we are very lucky in our institute that we have a, a, a pathology uh, uh, in our institute. Uh, we added natamycin to the treatment following following the culture and on hourly interval also for 48 hours. Uh, actually, we have a very good mother, and she was uh, doing this on a schedule. Uh, the condition started to regress we make treatment on the waking hours only and we added the steroid uh, of course there was so infiltration under the cover of the antibiotic the condition started to improve after we gave the steroid uh, with epithelial uh, healing leaving a residual opacity this was the condition uh, at the start of the problem and then this was the condition, uh, no staining at the center, but we have a uh, corneal opacity that much. Uh, actually, we were expecting that the child will be having a very uh, bad vision. We, uh, after resolution of the infection and inflammation, we started a bleopia treatment from that age by closing the other eye and giving midriatic, and we followed the baby for one year now. And this is the condition. Now, this is only the opacity present. Uh, she's one and uh, 1.3 uh, now. And uh, as we can see, she is she doesn't have squint or think she's fixating and she's seeing by the eye. 
and uh, she's a very lovely kid. So uh, my questions now, I'm going to start with Dr. Mahmoud Ismail this time. Uh, according to your experience, what is the most challenging in the infections in this stage? Uh, actually, this is a mixed infection and it's very rare in children to have mixed infection, both candida and, and you are lucky to diagnose it correctly at the beginning because, because mixed ex, uh, infections are very difficult to diagnose and identify. In my opinion, um, the worst thing is to have fungal infection in children. Um, it's because it, at the early stage, it doesn't give very uh, notable uh, uh, symptoms or, um, or severe angry eye or something like this. So what you did is correct to have activity starting by fortified. Actually, uh, sometimes fortified uh, eye drops Unfortunately, because they are um, uh, prepared uh, um, sometimes empirically like this, sometimes they are not in help, actually, they, sometimes they are against us. But uh, having a direct smear or direct uh, film, this have saved the eye for the patient. So I uh, diagnose candida. You always uh, suspect candida in a case of a birth, uh, birth child, or in a child that is in a rural area who is playing in uh, in rural areas, this might be of, of help. Uh, would you deal, Dr. Mahmoud? In this age, we cannot do keratoplasty in a case like this, because the wisdom says that if the patient is not uh, having trouble with the vision, leading to the severe amblyopia, you won't touch the patient. PTK in a case like this is, is not functioning. So keep on uh, following the patient, patching the eye. Sometimes you, you go for dilatation, one drop of dilatation. And If you can manage the patient until the age of five years and then start making him corneal topography or making at least uh, at least corneal topography in, uh, or a pentacam if you are lucky, uh, then you can start thinking about something for that situation. Let me first welcome uh, Dr. Guell, my dear friend, Dr. Guell. We know each other a long time ago. He is a very eminent surgeon and I thank him for joining us today in Egypt. Thanks, Mahmoud. It's, it's, as I mentioned, it's an honor, and, and I think that we are a group of, 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 of very, you are a group of very experienced surgeons, Mahmoud, Mohammed, El Salah, uh, uh, Eva, you, you, you are very experienced in that. So I only can add my, my, own, my, own, uh, my, my own thoughts, but I'm, I'm pretty sure that, that, that you also have strong experience in cases like that. I agree in what you just mentioned. It's a quite rare uh, to find, in a, at least in my experience, in, in very young kids, uh, this kind of, of, of um, combination of fungal and, and bacterial. It's not very common. It's not extremely uncommon, but it's not very common. I agree with you, except that uh, despite mm -hmm. of the um, of the resistance of all of us in doing corneal transplantation in very in very young kids, I definitely would uh, leave the uh, management of this case in my pediatric team. But more frequently, our pediatric team, uh, despite of starting the amblyopia treatment immediately. Uh, they uh, used to press us to do something around the 12 months age. And uh, because if the opacity after 10, 12 months is, is strong enough, I, as I can imagine in this uh, case, 
they find that the rehabilitation would be much more uh, simple if they have a clear cornea. And in this particular case, where the only problem is the opacity of the cornea, there is no uh, initially any other problem in this eye than the opacity, I think that the uh, rate of success in pediatric transplantation is quite good, uh, as it is not in other cases, such as uh, Peter's anomaly uh, in very young ages and, and another other kind of opacities where the anterior segment is also with problems. But in this particular case, the problem is only in the cornea, uh, hopefully, is if the pressure has been controlled. So I, I, would, I, I would think that my pediatric team would ask after six, seven, eight months of age to consider transplantation. Uh, just just uh, the, the pressure of the pediatric team sometimes leads us to do some early decisions. But Dr. Guell, do you think of penetrating uh, well, a case like this? You might be lucky to make it uh, a deep anterior lamella because probably the infection won't be very so deep. Even if you do anterior lamella, is even it's not not so bad option for it. But do you think the problem is? If, even if you have a successful case of uh, corneal transplant in an age like this, sometimes you are surprised by the outcome of refraction and still the patient needs ambliopia treatment. And no, of course, of course. absolutely, Mahmoud. I, I, I think that that's why these cases should not be managed by us once, yes. once uh, they are solved. Yes. So once the infection is solved, the decision is not our decision. I yeah. agree with you that, that this case possibly uh, is a good case for DALC mm. uh, and not necessarily PKP, of course. It should be done like uh, DALC, but you know, <clears throat> refraction can be much better managed with either contact lenses or with uh, spectacles uh, together with the, obviously with the, uh, with the uh, amblyopia treatment. So. Uh, closing the other eye in periods of time, and this will be managed by the pediatrics. But it's very difficult uh, to manage these cases if the opacity is very significant. So, so what you know if this, if the opacity is significant, amblyopia will, will be really, really, really uh, uh, deep. And so, so I I would definitely consider a dark around the age of 10, 12, or 15 months. Uh, but anyway, uh, it's it's quite difficult to defend one option in front of the other if you yes. do not have uh, about 100 cases similar like that and you have a prospective comparative study. So basically what, what we are saying is our own experience and, and our, our thoughts and our feelings. But yes. I think it's quite difficult to defend uh, one option in front of the other, uh, defending that that's the best and not the other one. So... Uh, so I would I would consider a dog in 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 a 10 12 months uh, patient like this one. I would definitely consider. Uh, uh, I would I would like to ask Dr. Mohammed Salah, are you uh, with the conservative treatment, Dr. Mohammed Salah? Okay, we are going to shift. Mute yourself, please, Dr. Mohammed. Mohammed, so we can, we can you hear us? Okay. You are, you are in silence. You are in silence, Mohammed. Sorry, not now. Yes. Yes. Dr. Okay. Mohammed, you you think that we uh, uh, what's the minimum age? Yes. Yes. Uh, here's in this the question. Case? Uh, first of all, I would like uh, to deeply thank uh, uh, Professor Boyle, uh, Professor Mohammed Sada, Professor Shaham, Professor and my dear brother, uh, Professor Mahmoud. Uh, for uh, participating in this uh, panel and uh, it gives us a very, very, very uh, motive for uh, our mic in the beginning. Uh, about your question, yes, sure, I am with conservative treatment. Sure, with conservative treatment. 
in such like cases, I uh, I think the opacity will be better by time. And even if not better, I would like to deal with by conservative measures such like uh, dilatation, iridectomy, uh, visual iridectomy, and uh, I would like uh, to uh, to mention that uh, keratoplasty such uh, like condition uh, no. I, I will not. Uh, I will uh, preserve the, the patient for, for follow up, and I think um, uh, it will go better. And no need to treat with surgical intervention. But if, if, as uh, Professor Gwen and Dr. Mahmoud said, uh, if we go for uh, keratoplasty, I prefer definitely to go with DALC. But uh, I think in this case, uh, it's better to wait and uh, to do conservative treatment. And even if we uh, have to interfere, uh, just like uh, maximum peripheral aridectomy, uh, I think it's better or to dilate the pupil and to it. Okay, we are going to shift to another case. This is a newborn baby, incubated baby. Uh, presented with bilateral corneal opacity, and this was his corneal opacity. This is right eye, and this is the left eye. Uh, our diagnosis at that time was that he was having a bilateral uh, Peters anomaly with other conditions, uh, systemic conditions. Uh, we uh, left this baby, and we confirmed the diagnosis with the UVM and ultrasound. Uh, the ultrasound was normal, and the condition was confirmed by the UVM later on. Uh, my question here uh, to uh, Dr. Mohamed Seda first, uh, of course, you have seen a lot of cases uh, of Peter's anomaly. Uh, when do you uh, uh, interfere in these cases with uh, uh, surgical intervention? And uh, do you give them, do you have cases which goes uh, with good vision uh, without surgical intervention? Uh, well, uh, let me first welcome Dr. Muhammad Salah. I didn't know that he was present, but now that I know, I tell him thank you very much for inviting me. Well, thank you. The management, the management of corneal opacities or dense corneal opacity, if it is a dense corneal opacity, this is a different strategy from a light corneal opacity. If you have a light corneal opacity in the sense that you can see a red reflex, and you can uh, follow up this uh, red reflex present all the time, then you have to go conservative. You have to go, if unilateral with uh, amblyopia therapy, uh, if uh, bilateral uh, with the rotation of the pupil. But if the opacity is dense and you cannot get any red reflex and the stigmas is starting to appear, then in this case, you will have to interfere because nystagmus is a very important sign. The presence or the appearance of nystagmus means that the visual system is handicapped and hit uh, strongly by uh, the media opacity. So you have to interfere. By interfering, you have to do a replacement of this cornea and managing any other anterior segment abnormality that is present. Implanting a cornea in the pediatric age group is really a bad prognosis. This is an operation that is disappointing. The, the, after a long journey in this, uh, in this job, I can tell you that the percentage of success of penetrating keratoplasty can be in the range of 15 to 20%, which means that if you operate 10 cases of penetrating keratoplasty with excellent grafts, excellent surgeon, excellent procedure, and excellent until the end of the line, you will end up with 80% having a bad graft. Sometimes you are lucky to end up with a semi-opaque graft. But most of the time, you end up with an opaque graft and you have to reoperate. And every time you reoperate, you get a worse prognosis. So penetrating keratoplasty is, uh, uh, is not really um, uh, a fruitful surgery. It's a surgery that can be disappointing. 
So when you go to penetrating keratoplasty, you have to make sure that this is the only way you can do. Uh, there is nothing else to be done as a conservative management, so you have to pass through the dilemma of penetrating keratoplasty. Lamellar grafting is a good idea. If you are sure that the posterior layers are not affected, then you can go with Zalk and so on. But I had no experience with Zalk in pediatric age group. Uh, uh, I have only experience with penetrating keratoplasty. So in conclusion, if you have a light opacity that you judge light by the red reflex and the, pa the baby is, is progressing in vision, there are milestones for vision. If the vision is progressing, you have a red reflex, vision is progressing, then keep him away from penetrating keratoplasty. But if you have a dense opacity, you cannot elicit any red reflex. You have other complications than the cornea and the opacified cornea, like a cataract, for example, or pupillary anomalies or glaucoma or whatever, then you have to go through the difficult route of penetrating keratoplasty. Thank you, Dr. Mohammed. Uh, Dr. Gwen? Absolutely, absolutely agree with the thoughts of uh, Mohammed. Absolutely. Okay. Uh, What's the minimum age? Uh, and if the case is bilateral or unilateral, your decision will differ? No, my, my decision basically, as I mentioned, is discussed with the pediatric team, but the considerations are the same. In most of cases like the ones that I can see in the screen right now, with a dilated pupil and if not able to be dilated, if the crystal lens is clear, so if I can observe under anesthesia uh, the posterior pole, I would not do any surgery. My, my point in the previous case was that I, obviously I would wait some months but if I, after 10, 12 months, the opacity is significant, occupying, as I have seen in this, in this slide, the, the whole cornea, and I cannot see any, any, uh, mm. any image of the, of the retina. Of the I think that the vision will be with, without surgery, zero. So you should assume the risk. And because that case uh, possibly had no, uh, endothelial uh, affectation, we can go through a dark, which in my experience for 25 years has much better prognosis than PKP. But basically, the comments that, Mac and the, that Mohammed uh, mentioned, I absolutely agree. I think the risk uh, of PKP in the kids is so high that it makes no sense to do it unless completely necessary. Uh, Dr. Guan, uh, have you done DALC in this ages? Uh, is it easy? I, I, I find DALC in uh, children is a little bit uh, harder than the adults. Separation is not that easy in it's, the it's this much, is I agree with you, Russia. It's much harder, as I, I think that perhaps we talked when you stay in, in Barcelona. Uh, I, and, and, and on the other hand, it is so important to escape from having a unfortunate PKP case that you need to be generous leaving some posterior stroma in place. So you, you should not uh, look for a big bubble technique in such a case. You need to use a layer by layer technique, trying to go as deep as possible, but recognizing that if you uh, leave a relatively clear posterior stroma and you clarify the, the, the anterior cornea the, in front of a significant opacity, the amblyopia treatment afterwards will be much more effective. If there is a significant opacity, you will, you, you will not succeed despite that you wait for many years. So, so you, you, yes, no big bubble, try to do layer by layer. Layer by layer. Okay, Dr. Hamdes Mail, uh, are you yes. with us in all of this? Yes, Dr. Arasha, uh, this is a case 
not a complete details anomaly. Yes. So in the left, uh, the, the left saying uh, this other eye, the, the slide on the left hand side, actually in a case like this, unfortunately, I think you had, you will be uh, have you will have to interfere with it. Mm. Turguel have mentioned very carefully the procedure of, uh, of anterior lamellar uh, keratoplasty, and I do agree with him because uh, sometimes you have to instead of perforating the cornea and having a penetrating keratoplasty. Uh, UBM is very important in a case like this if you are going to do a cornea transplant because if there is a complete Peters anomaly and uh, this genesis, anterior segment this genesis, so the iris and lens are stuck somehow to the back of the cornea, mm. bad news. You have to go for penetrating and release everything. And um, uh, as Professor said, I have said, even if doing everything, you have a very low success rate. Please, okay. go ahead. Uh, we are going to shift to the other case. This is a three years old child with bilateral sclerocornea. His vision was hand movement bilaterally and he could differentiate colors. They, uh, he was a very smart kid. Uh, we asked for a UBM ultrasound and VEP. His uh, mother and father are asking for any solution for his condition. And this was his picture. Uh, this was the uh, UBM, his UBM in the right eye. Uh, the right eye was a totally opaque thickened uh, cornea and with shallow irregular anterior chamber, iris processes with XMP anomaly, cataractus anteriorly displaced lens with intact anterior lens capsule. The angle is closed almost in all quadrant except a, slit, a small slit. Uh, the ultrasound was completely normal in the right eye, normal ocular contour with the axial lens 23.5. Opaque anterior, uh, anterior displaced lens, retina in place, and optic nerve uh, head was normal, and the AV, VEP shows functioning visual pathway. My question here was, uh, I will start with uh, Dr. Um, Dr. Mahmoud Ismail this time. Would you interfere in this case? Yes. Dr. Well, uh, can I share case? my screen, please? Because I want to show you the last. Yeah. Uh, Dr. You would, uh, what, Doctor? You want to show me what? Uh, uh, can I share my screen? Okay, I will stop yes. sharing mine. Just let me share your screen. Stop sharing. Okay. Uh, what is the problem of sclerocornea? The problem of sclerocornea is, is actually not the problem of the anterior segment if, uh, if the iris has the schizogenesis or the cataractus lens or the displaced lens or the peripheral anterior synechia. You might be able to, uh, to succeed in that chest case. But the problem is, even if you do successful case like this in, in, in a sclerocornea, like if you can see, I don't know if you can see the slide or not, the problem is you still have no stem cells. So this patient, even if it succeeds for some time, actually it ends by after a few years with a big cornea. But at least the patient has saved, you have patient, the, the, the child, you have saved him from deep ampliopia. You have, at least he has some vision and he has succeeded in having some studies in small studies in, in, in his life and he has managed one or two years of going to school, or he has managed to learn some Quran in the first uh, few years. Somehow you have pushed the child in the early years of his. So in my uh, opinion, I will start uh, stop uh, sharing the screen. In my opinion, you can share your screen once again, Dr. Uh, Raja. 
the problem is not only operative it's it's later on what will happen to this child because of the stem cell failure okay Russia, you have the the microphone. Yeah. Okay. Uh, would you start it now or? Uh, the question is when. When. When is the because this child is has. Russia, you can go ahead. Okay, I can hear. Yes. Uh, after 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 a few months, whenever yeah. yeah. In, in a case like this, I would choose the best eye with the investigation in my hand. I choose the best eye. 12 months, I will have to, he has to be operated by 12 months. Okay. Dr. Guad, do you prefer to do prosthesis in these cases or just go with uh, regular PKP first? Well, this is a, this is a good question. And always cleocornea is, is a nightmare. The problem in this case, Having seen the, the UVM, and as in my experience has been in most cases with the cornea, the problem is not the cornea, but the eye. And so, uh, so because in, 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 in this case, and in many of the cases that I've been dealing with, the angle is closed 360 degrees. Uh, the anterior segment is completely uh, uh, moved forward. So the first thing to do is, in most cases, a lensectomy, vitrectomy. And if we have an area of the angle open to do a, uh, a glaucoma surgery, standard glaucoma surgery, if the angle is closed 360 degrees, you need to put a tube because anything that you can do on the cornea uh, will be the same in a sclerocornea case. So, uh, what we used to do is we, as Mahmoud was saying, we select the best eye together with the glaucoma team and then we do a combined surgery with lensectomy, vitrectomy, tube, or glaucoma surgery, and we do full thing in scatoplasty because in those cases, uh, the lamellar do not work. I, I agree with Mahmoud that in, in, in the limbus, many cases will opacify, will can be realized. And But I very much prefer to do, to do not implant a keratoprosthesis at this very young age, so I prefer to leave the cornea. Sometimes you have a clear cornea for a period of time enough to have some develop, development of vision. And then you might consider in the future to use a keratoprosthesis. But I, I insist in those cases, the key point is to deal with the glaucoma team because this would be the most critical part, more, much more than the cornea. Uh, Dr. Mohamed Salah, you, you have told me that- I cannot hear you. Oh, okay. Now you can hear me? I have bad connection, I cannot hear. Yes, I um, can hear you, I can hear you. Okay. Uh, yes, Dr. I can hear you. <laughs> okay. Dr. Mohamed said uh, uh, you have seen a lot of cases like that. I cannot that. hear nothing. It's a problem of connection. Uh, you I can only see faces without movement and no sound. Uh, we can hear you. We can hear you well. Dr. Mohamed Sada, you have seen a lot of cases in uh, Abu Rish uh, hospital um, of these cases. Do you think that they have uh, uh, chances of, see, of seeing or vision? Well, uh, uh, sclerocornea is a very uh, difficult condition because uh, um, 
the rule of uh, the density of the corneal opacity applies here. When you have a very dense corneal opacity, you have to take the risk of a PK. And so this is a condition where you will have to proceed with a big PK, especially that those cases, most of the time, they have the brunt of the anomaly in the anterior part of the eye, not in the posterior part of the eye. They have good retina, they have good uh, optic nerve, they have good ERGs, good VEPs. And so most of the time, you are furious because you know that this baby can see, but you have to pass through a difficult surgery in order to make him see. I'll tell you what I do. I do tell the parents that I'm going to operate at least, at least twice. In the first time, the first cornea that I implant is going to pacify. This is what I tell the parents from the first time. And when it opacifies, I'm going to implant another smaller uh, trefine, trefine uh, graft inside this cornea. So I create a bed because there is a problem with the stem cells, as Dr. Mahmoud said, and there is a major problem with the intraocular pressure. So regarding the cornea, I do it on two steps. One cornea that is going to opacify most probably within a year. And then the second surgery is inside this graft. If you do an eight millimeter graft the first time, the second time it would be a six millimeter graft. And for the glaucoma now, which is a major problem here, glaucoma is an enemy for the graft. So for the glaucoma, now I'm using the micro pulse diode laser and it's giving me fantastic results. And I advise you all to try it not to try the conventional surgeries that we know of, like the tubes and so on. The cyclodiode is the most, the micropulse, the micropulse, the new version, is a very reasonable procedure to use here because the angle is deformed. There is no way to operate on this angle. You will get, you will end up by failure. You will end up by a secondary rise of intraocular pressure. But if you decrease the aqueous production, this is going to be more Logic. In the resume, for the cornea, two surgeries, a large graft and then a smaller graft inside, and the results, of course, are guarded. For the glaucoma, the micropulse diode laser is giving me very good results in those cases. And for the stem cells, uh, uh, there is nothing that you can do except that you have, uh, you don't have really a, a definite um, proof that all over the surface of the eye, there is no stem cell. But maybe if we succeed with the second graft with a, a semi-opaque graft, it will be a good thing to, uh, to achieve. Thank you. I think that Muhammad Salah will have the same opinion. This was my, our uh, plan. Yes. yes, I totally agree with uh, Professor Seda. Uh, this is a very, very, very difficult situation and very difficult case. Totally agree with Dr. Sada uh, with uh, two additions. Number one or two difficulties. Number one, how to convince the parents to do uh, posterior, uh, to do penetrating keratoplasty for twice with very long follow-up and uh, you know how is how is difficult the follow-up of keratoplasty. The second is the economic aspect. How also to convince them about the economic aspect. Um, it's a very difficult situation. Uh, I think um, uh, what's said by Dr. Sada is uh, uh, ideal or the optimum, and we can do nothing uh, more. Okay, our next case uh, is a little bit cheerful case, uh, mostly after that uh, two cases. Our 13 years old child, his reflection was plano in the other in one eye, and the other eye was minus 13.5 and with minus three astigmatism. It's the best corrected visual acuity 636 in this eye. Uh, they are, of course, they are coming for an effective procedure for him uh, as, uh, as a treatment of manizometropia, and we will have a debate here. Uh, this was his uh, pentacam. The care readings was good and the astigmatism. This is his right pentacam. 
uh, and this was his left pentacam. Uh, the readings was good. The uh, central corneal thickness is 500, and the AC depth was 3.3, which is very good. So, uh, we, uh, my question here to uh, Dr. Mohammed Sada first, as a pediatric ophthalmology first. Uh, do you treat these cases with a surgical treatment or you prefer to go conservative with glasses and uh, contact lenses? Our pediatric uh, unit said that they, they could treat this anisometropia conservatively. Well, um, I'm always conservative. <laughs> I like to be conservative <laughs> because uh, you, have to, you have to remember that Operating in a pediatric eye is not like operating on a senile eye. There are so many risks and so many complications that can happen. Mm -hmm. So I start uh, with a conservative management. I start with glasses. I start with patching. Uh, I try all these items and I insist on the patching and I uh, insist um, uh, aggressively on the patching uh, until I'm sure that the vision is not improving. If the vision is not improving, then there is no other way but operating. Okay, so we have still, we have the surgical option. Yes, uh, of course. Of course. Uh, Dr. Guel, uh, do you think that, Dr. Guel, are you with us? You can hear us now? No, 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 I'm here, yes. Okay. Uh, as a refresh, uh, I can hear not very well, but I can hear you. And I, I have heard. Do you think also that it's a surgical option? It's well, mandatory, I, or you go for a conservative? Uh, you think well, glasses and or in this uh, between in the difference between uh, thirteen degrees could could work? Well, I think that from from my experience, if, again, and I'm I'm very sorry to. To, to refer to my pediatric team, because uh, in many cases, they are the ones who are taking the decision. But what I know from them is that the use of spectacles and amblyopia treatment doesn't work too well in these cases, because uh, doesn't work too well and they, they try to escape from that. In this case, if they would be able to use contact lenses, if the patient would be able to use contact lens, together with the amblyopia treatment, then I think is the best option. No, no doubt that no surgery is the best option in children's, but it is not so simple for some cases. Uh, and then from time to time, the pediatric team comes to us asking if we might consider to do the surgery. And uh, without any doubt, if I would consider to do surgery in this case, because the pediatric team asked me to do it, uh, what I would consider is an Artiflex uh, implantation and not any laser surgery. So independently of the thickness of the cornea, independently of everything, I would consider an Artiflex implantation because I would not like to have in an ASA cornea uh, that I would leave in this cornea if I do laser surgery. So, so uh, my option, if the pediatric sacs me to do it, is to do an artiflex implantation. Uh, do you have any experience with the RCL in this age? No, no, I have. I got experience with the ICL when the ICL appears in the market long time ago. Uh, in fact, in Spain, I was the one implanting the first uh, the first lenses, but uh, I started working with the artiflex artisan, as you know. And that's my favorite option. Uh, but I think that the ICL would also work, but I do not like the ICL as much as I like the artifacts. Uh, Dr. Mohamed Salah, uh, do you think, uh, are you with us with the, uh, these options? Yes, uh, from refractive point of view, as a refractive surgeon, I would uh, <laughs> uh, go for surgery. Uh, as a compliance of patient with contact lens or uh, patching with glasses, I think uh, not practical. Uh, my uh, favorite for this patient is ICL, then for artisan. Uh, 
with definitely uh, help of uh, Ayman al and uh, Hebam Twali for treatment of amblyopia, resultant amblyopia. Oh, yes, for treatment of amblyopia. Yes, definitely. Yes. But from a refractive point of view, uh, I think it's better to do surgery in this case. Of course, Dr. Ayman want me to ask him this question, whether to do surgery or not, because he's going to say no. But we will do it. Anyway, I have done it already. We will repair him uh, post opera. Good for you. He's lucky for this. I just want to mention something that, that the age is, is, is a clue also. I mean, it differs. We're talking about that as atropia, you know, which age four, four, five, six, different than teenagers. This is one factor. Another factor that that I, I, I agree that the decision, yes, is, is should should be combined between the cornea and the pediatric. But um, the, the compliance with patching is, is is a big issue in, in these cases. When I face a case of an isometropia and I decide that this patient needs surgery and I'm going to refer the patient for a surgery, and guess what? I do this sometimes, this, uh, refer the patient to, to do surgery for this. I prefer to, to I ask the, the cornea consultant working with that, please leave this patient for me for a few months. This patient has to taste the amblyopia therapy before starting the surgery. I mean, if the patient first presented, the patient went to refractive surgery, these patients are after the surgery and then they come back for us for amblyopia therapy is very hard to comply because they felt that the problem has finished. So I always say, even if we agree that this patient will be operated upon, please leave the patient for me for a few months with the, with the glasses and patch. We have to make sure before going to surgery that this patient will be compliant with the patch. She has to, the patient has to finish this. If they agree, they can be compliant for patching. At that moment, it's uh, it's okay to do this. I don't. Dr. Mohammed Sada has, of course, been much huge experience in this, and I'm eager to, to listen to his opinion about this this point. The compliance of patching after the refractive surgery. You think it's the same? Or before, because I feel that's a huge decline in the compliance of the of the amblyopia therapy after the surgery. You, 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 have, you have the same the same thought. Yes, it's true. Um, my choice was similar to Doctor uh, Guell's choice. I chose to do a very flex for this patient, and the refraction was uh, uh, plano with minus two astigmatism. And uh, the uh, best corrected visual acuity improved from, from 336 to 612. In my own experience, the, the best corrected visual acuity improved in this cases even uh, without before doing the, uh, the, the amplyopia treatment. And this encouraged the, yani, we should inform the, the mother and father to do, to complete the amplyopia treatment, but uh, actually uh, that we see. Uh, this is your retinal magnification, Yarash. Improved retinal yes. magnification. Uh, w w this is what we can uh, do for this patient. Yes. Uh, I think it's no. valid yes, for the patient. Yes. Dr. Mahmoud Smail, do you prefer Veriflex or ICL? No, I prefer Veriflex. Veriflex. Because this child is still growing and I'm not sure the angle will still be supporting an ICL in a... Uh, the, the, I'm sorry, the circus would be uh, the same. At, uh, uh, also, I would like to stress on something that this is a two-step surgery, as Dr. Mohammed said, I have said. It's very important to inform the family that this is not the end. It might be needing a, uh, an addition of LASIK later on because uh, he's still growing. And uh, in spite that he has a magnificent uh, outcome now, uh, Dr. Arash. Thank you. Uh, actually, this case shows a very good result with all the doctors. Uh, the anisometropia is one of the uh, best uh, refractive results. Dr. Gual, I know that you have a great experience with the uh, Veriflex. Uh, have you faced the problems uh, regarding the eviitis or, uh, uh, or these things with children? Not really. Uh, we have had a very, very good, very good results with the with the Adiflex. In fact, uh, and with the Adisan. In fact, this I I was expecting to have in this age group more uh, granulomatose reactions, as mm. from time to time you can see in adults. But I've seen much well in in any single case. 
I must say that I have implanted about 20 or 30 cases, not more in all my life, in the pediatric, uh, younger than 10 years old. So it's not a very common surgery also for me, but no problems in any of them, except the one that that uh, Ismail was, was basically pointing out, which is some degree of refractive change with time. But, but again, not significant. And in most cases, it has been able to be dealt either with the spectacles and sometimes later with LASIK surgery. So. Uh, actually, uh, this is our last case. And uh, I would like to thank all the, uh, the uh, doctors, my professors and doctors uh, who are participating with us. And uh, I'm very uh, glad that uh, we can uh, share uh, this experience with you. Thank you, Rasha. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Rasha. Thank, thank you, Dr. Gwell, and thank you, Dr. Mohamed Sadr, Dr. Mohamed Ismail, and Dr. Uh, Siham, for your time. Thank and you very much. And, uh, we, we, we have the promise of Dr. Gwell to join us in a future uh, cornea meeting. Si Dios quiere, campeón, como dicen. <laughs> Muchas gracias. And, and, and it has been an honor for me to share some time with... Uh, with By the way, with, Dr. Gwell uh, has teach LASIK for uh, all Spain. Good. That's good. Well, for, for Madrid and the fencers, uh, today is a good day. Let's see what <laughs> happens. <laughs> Who will win, Gwell? Who will win? I hope that, that the English guys... <laughs> of course. <laughs> it's very clear. <laughs> Absolutely clear. Absolutely. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Gwil. We hope to see you in Mike in, uh, in Egypt uh, soon, as soon as possible. Yes. Okay, yes. I, hope, I hope so too. Thank, Thank you, Dr. Mohamed Saad, our professor. Thank you, my dear brother, Dr. Mahmoud. Thank you very much, Dr. Salah. It's an honor. Thank you. For me. Thank you, very, thank you very much. Thank you, Thank you, Dr. Mohamed Saad. Thank you, Dr. Gwil. Dr. Saba, Shakir Mohammed Bey, Alf Shokra, Dr. Mohammed Basha Saba. Thank you very much. Shokri, Dr. Rasha, Dr. Heba, and Shakir. Thank you, Dr. Ayman and Dr. Heba, for this meeting. Thank you, Ayman. Thank you, Heba. Very, very good. Thank you, Karim, Novartis, RM, and Shogolon. Alf Shokra. Bye bye. Bye.